In many ways, I think I mis mistitled the presentation, and rather than being cyber war and the future of warfare, it might well be cyber war is the future of warfare. The reason for this is uh, simply that, um, as Sanger, David Sanger argues in this book, uh, The Perfect Weapon, the rise of cyber warfare marks a profound change in the nature of warfare. He quotes General Michael Hayden, who some of you may know was the director of the United States' National Security Agency, as well as the Central Intelligence Agency. Hayden said, somebody just used a new weapon and this weapon will not be put back in the box. And then Hayden added, this has a whiff of August 1945, meaning, of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Sanger cited in this book Henry Kissinger, who also noted that after the invention of the atomic bomb, nothing could ever be the same. And I would say the same is true with cyber warfare. In The Perfect Weapon, Sanger suggests that as of early 2018, the best estimates there are have been upward of 200 known state-on-state -state cyber attacks over the past decade or so, a figure that only describes those that have become public, and many of them have not. Let me recommend unequivocally that if you want one book to take you into this world, Sanger's book is the one that you might read. He's a journalist by trade, and tells the story in a very compelling manner. Um, before I explore, uh, explore the current status of uh, cyber war, let me provide you with some um, a synopsis of attacks on computer systems and a bit of the technical information that you should be aware of when you're thinking about these issues. Of course, there's a Hungarian involved, right? I mean, you, you cannot do something of this sort without, uh, how do I do this? There, no, the other way, huh? There we are. There he is, Neumann Janos, <laughs> right? Uh, otherwise known as John von Neumann for some people. Um, his article uh, in the aftermath of World War II on the, quote, theory of self-reproducing automa automata was central to the development of the concepts that led to what are called today worms and viruses. Um, and to look at some of the milestones in malware and, and distinctions between worms and, and viruses, let me give you a, a, a brief look at that. Um, a virus is a computer program that makes copies of itself and harms the computer in different ways. It has become a vil the, vi the villain of the computer and cyberspace. Unlike worms, viruses cannot propagate, it, propagate themselves. It needs instead a user's intervention to trans, transfer from one host to another. Like for instance, while copying files from an infected computer to another healthy computer. The virus gets attached with the file and gets transformed along with the file. And there's a difference between viruses and worms. Viruses self replicating, it can't propagate itself, and von Neumann's design was the design for the world's first computer virus, right? Uh, and it doesn't affect the network. It does modify code, and it can infect files. Worms, however, which uh, in many ways are, I would argue, more dangerous, it's a self-propagating uh, uh, um, uh, computer program that transfers through a computer network. It has the ability to propagate through the network. And the first one was in 1988. I'll say a few words about that in a minute. The Morris worm. Uh, and it's, it's the first computer worm. Uh, I, yeah, do you ever think back to when you first had a computer yourselves? Mine was 1982. Anybody before that? I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary how much you had one. Uh, <laughs> another, not, not unexpected. Um, it doesn't modify code, it doesn't affect the net network's bandwidth, um, and it usually occupies memory space in the bandwidth of the computer network. Sounds all very technical, but so let me bring you into um, what's ac actually happening today. Th this is the first um, uh, worm, uh, excuse me, first virus, um, uh, uh, creeper. And this is what your, your screen would, would say. Um, 
uh, I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. It was an experimental self-replicating program. Um, and what's interesting about it is that it gained access via the ARPANET. I don't know if you know what that is, but it was set up by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Network, the Pentagon, basically, right? Um, and we um, owe a lot to the Pentagon for the current situation, as well as the internet. Um, the, um, it was eventually, a program was created to delete Creeper, but the, the game went on. And one of the things to recognize in all of this, uh, this one, Elk Cloner in 1981, <laughs> it was teenagers, right, that were doing this. And oftentimes, aside from the state-to-state -state attacks, it's still teenagers. Um, David Sanger, and towards the end of his book, says, uh, says one of the reasons the situation is rather uncontrollable is because we all have teenagers. They're still at it, right? Um, Elk Cloner was written for Apple II, which is the first computer I had, and it was created by a guy named Richard Screnta, and it led to the first large-scale virus outbreak in history. He was 15 years old. Uh, and on winter break from high school, wrote this, uh, this first uh, large-scale virus, virus, which became self-spreading to personal computers uh, in early 1982. Um, he, he says that it, it was um, a, a dumb little practical joke. He thought it would just attack the computers of his friends. Um, he was already known as a video game prankster among his friends, and uh, he often shared his, his gaming uh, software. Um, and if an infected computer would say this, the program with a personality, it will get on all your disks, it will infant infiltrate your chips. Yes, it's cloner, right? It will stick to you like glue, it will modify RAM too. Send in the cloner. I um, maybe it all starts with the kids, huh? Um, uh, it was very considered very contagious um, and successfully infected um, uh, the floppy disks of most people he knew, and that was only the beginning, right? Um, now, the Pakistani brain virus in 1986 was actually a virus that went into the boot system, right? So that, that um, uh, it, it affected a lot of IBM personal computers, and again, it was two guys, this is 25 years after they started it, but they were teenagers in Pakistan, playing around, right? And this is, this is what happens all the time, Basit Farooq and his brother Ahmed. Um, um, and what's interesting about this, uh, this, was ha this happened um, uh, at that time, um, uh, Stone, a stoner comes a, uh, along, and <laughs> you can imagine who the people were who started the stoned virus, right? Your PC is now stoned. Um, it, um, to give you a little background, it's a, it's a boot sector uh, a computer virus, so it affects the, the booting mechanism of the computer. Created in 1987, it was one of the very first viruses um, written by um, the original of which was thought to have been written by a university student in Wellington, New Zealand. By 1989, it had spread widely in New Zealand and Australia, and variants became very common worldwide in the 1990s. A computer infected with the original version had a one in eight probability that the screen would declare, your PC is now stoned, right? Um, <laughs> later, <laughs> it said something different, uh, and you can probably understand why, it would say legalize marijuana, right? <laughs> That's why the computer and the uh, maker of this little gem was stoned. Um, uh, but, it, you know, it changed the rules of the game as we tend to know it, and this is, of course, what happened. Um, and again, this guy, uh, Morris, who started the Morris worm, the Morris worm, was created by a guy named Robert Tappan Morris, um, and uh, it uh, connected to the U Unix system, which many universities at first had and other institutions. It became the first worm to spread extensively in the wild. Interestingly, in his biography, um, again, uh, Morris was a kid, 
Uh, um, uh, his father, however, was the chief scientist of an organization known as the National Security Agency. <laughs> I think this is evolutionary, Dan. <laughs> um, uh, let's see what else we have here. Oh, the M Michelangelo vi virus. <laughs> <laughs> and why was it called the Michelangelo virus? Well, it's a variant of the stoned virus uh, and was hyped by a computer security executive. You know, some of you may have an um, a antivirus program by, by McAfee. John McAfee um, uh, predicted in 1991 the, vi the Michelangelo virus would wipe out information on millions of c computers. Actually, there was very little damage. It was first discovered in Australia in early 1991, but why was it named Michelangelo? Well, <laughs> it was first discovered, uh, so each year the virus remained dormant until March 6th. Guess whose birthday that was? Michelangelo, right? This is why they called it the Michelangelo virus. Um, uh, now, the next one is one of my favorites, Code Red. Sounds like it's a state-to-state -state attack, doesn't it? You know, Code Red. Um, it was a computer worm. Uh, it was observed on the internet in uh, the summer of uh, 2001. It attacked computers running on Microsoft's uh, web, web server. It was first discovered by two young men. Uh, uh, and why did they call it Code Red? Anybody guess? Anybody know? They were drinking Mountain Dew Code Red. <laughs> and this is, you know, um, the names of viruses and worms are often multiple. And one of them may come to predominate. But the reason, one of the reasons they're multiple is because different um, uh, antivirus companies and security companies name them what they want to name them, right? And it's just a question of, of culture, I suppose, that as to which one becomes predominant and then is used uh, on and on. Um, and finally, in this uh, uh, sort of intro, this is the slammer worm, and this gives you a visual of, of how much it infected. It is also known as the sapphire worm, and attacks became the fastest spreading uh, worm of all time, crashing the internet within 15 minutes of its release. Uh, it began to be noticed in early 2003 as it slowed down systems worldwide. The slowdown was caused by the collapse of numerous routers w under the burden of extremely high bombardment traffic from infected servers. Normally, when traffic is too high for routers to handle, the routers are supposed to delay or temporarily stop network traffic. Instead, some routers crashed, and the neighbor routers would notice that these routers had stopped and should not be contacted. Um, in other words, uh, removed from the table of routers. Routers started sending notices to this effect to other routers they knew about. The flood of routed, routing table updates caused some additional routers to fail, compounding the problem. Eventually, the crashed routers um, um, restarted them, uh, causing them to announce their status, leading to another wave of routing table updates. Soon, a significant portion of internet bandwidth was consumed by routers communicating with each other to update their routing tables, and ordinary data traffic slowed down on, uh, and in some cases, stopped altogether. Uh, it was small in size, only 376 bytes, and sometimes it was able to get through uh, even uh, with legitimate traffic. Um, let's see, next slide. Now we get into the, the big change, okay? This is, um, this is when you start seeing state-to-state -state actors. Um, and it's now that we can start to use the term cyber war or cyber warfare. Um, one of the first is Moonlight Maze. Some professionals in the field of, uh, inside the cyber field, but certainly not all, began to worry about after what was called the Moonlight Maze attack over several years in the late 1990s. Um, but there was little of great significance, right? 
uh, that was collected by the attackers, and although there seemed to be a Russian connection, it wasn't certain. American networks went under siege in what is now called Operation Moonlight Maze. Back then, the FBI was investigating a breach into the Department of Defense satellite control systems. Again, while the first accusations for the source of this attack were Russian authorities, it was fairly clearly shown that they were not formally implicated in the attack. The only certitude about the operation was that the attack went through a Russian proxy. Uh, the next big one is Titan Rain. Uh, not only did the United States uh, recognize that cyber warfare will be an important part of the upcoming conflicts, but China does as well as Russia. Um, and they're, of course, slated to become heavyweights uh, in, on the world stage just in general. Now, even with armed forces of two million active personnel, China is trying to modernize its military uh, to, the more, to be more mobile and efficient. And this is really kind of frightening. In 1999, two Chinese Air Force uh, colonels uh, discussed new ways to conduct war in a military guidebook titled Unrestricted Warfare, where they described the use of computers as new weapons for future warfare. And here's some of what they said. <clears throat> With technological developments, being in the process of striving to increase the types of weapons, a breakthrough in our thinking can open up the domain of the weapons kingdom at one stroke. As we see it, a single man-made stock market crash, a single computer in virus invasion, or a single rumor or scandal that results in a fluctuation in the enemy's country's exchange rates, or exposes the leaders of an enemy country on the internet, all can be included in the ranks of new concept weapons. Concrete realization of these ideas may have happened as soon as four years after the publication of this military guide uh, during Operation Titan Rain in 2003. With a computer network of more than 3.5 million computers spread across 65 countries, the Pentagon faces many challenges against a strong and sophisticated attack and Operation Titan Rain tended to prove this. Apparently, hackers based or using proxies based in China successfully attacked American networks in a coordinated attack over the course of simply six plus hours. And in that period, they did the following. They exploited vulnerabilities at the US Army Information Systems Engineering Command at Fort Oaxaca in Arizona, exploited the same hole in computers at the Defense Information Systems Agency in Arlington, Virginia, uh, attack the Naval Ocean Systems Center, a Defense Department installation in San Diego, and struck the U.S. Army Space and Strategic Defense Installation in Huntsville, Alabama, among others. This resulted in the theft of significant classified information. Many other attacks have been uh, suspected to originate from China against most of the G7 countries, such as France and the U.K. and Germany, as well as uh, um, New Zealand and India. Uh, and those are the ones that have been reported. Now, one of the uh, most interesting people, <laughs> you may remember him, um, in January 2007, and this gives you a sense of how um, behind the times uh, um, the officials can be. Um, so in 2007, Negroponte, who was then the US Director of National Intelligence, presented his annual worldwide threat assessment to the US Congress. It forced the intelligence officials to rank the major threats to the United States in public, and it could thereby be rather revealing. Negroponte began his testimony with the claim that, quote, terrorism remains the preeminent threat to the homeland, end quote. Other threats were listed, but cyber attacks were not even mentioned in his report. So he didn't even speak to it. Now, in late, uh, maybe that's because he wasn't a teenager, who knows. Um, in late 2008, and this is one of the most fascinating ways in which these attacks occur. Late 2008, a few weeks before Barack Obama was elected US president, at Fort Meade in Maryland, where the National Security Agency is housed, officials found that Russians were suddenly inside the Pentagon's most classified networks. This had never happened before, and the NSA officials found that the Russians had infiltrated the secret uh, internet protocol router network that connected the senior officials in the White House, the intelligence agencies, and the military. 
They tried desperately to figure out how the breach had occurred and were shocked when they found out how. <laughs> how do you think it occurred? The picture tells you part of the story, right? <laughs> the Russians had littered USB pen drives around the parking lot and public areas of a US military base in the Middle East. And when someone picked it up <laughs> and put it into a laptop connected to the secret network, the Russians were in it too. <laughs> and that was the game. That was the game. Um, and speaking of games, the big, the big operation that the US subsequently gets into is Operation Olympic Games. Maybe some of you have heard about it because it was widely reported in the press at the time. Although, although somehow I, I often just pass by those because I thought I wouldn't understand it. I should have paid more attention at the time. At the same time the Russians were infiltrating the top secret US networks, the United States and Israel were engaged in an even more clandestine attack in Iran called Operation Olympic Games designed to destroy the centrifuges that were the essential technology for enriching uranium uh, uh, to bomb grade at, the, uh, at Iran's remote desert facility in Nantaz. Um, uh, informing the uh, uh, US-Israeli effort, and this is interesting, <clears throat> was the US government's desire to restrain the Israelis, and especially Benjamin Netanyahu, from the desire to simply bomb the Iranian facilities, uh, as the Israelis had done previously. Um, the goal was to, uh, this is Ahmadinejad at the Nantes uh, uh, facility, uh, the goal was to gain access to the plant's industrial computer controls. It was the computer controls that became the object of their uh, cyber work, uh, so that they would invade the specialized computers that command the centrifuges. Collaboration happened with uh, Israeli uh, intelligence service and the, it's, a, it's a, a title you may want to remember, Unit 8200, right? That's the, that's the Israeli uh, cyber attack forces. Um, Israel's involvement was important to the United States because the Israelis had deep intelligence about operations at Natez. Um, and Amer American officials wanted, as I suggested, to dissuade the Israelis from carrying out a, a bombing of the facilities. Uh, to prevent a conventional psych uh, uh, attack, um, um, uh, Israel had to be deeply involved in Operation Olympic Games. The computer virus created by the two countries became known first as the bug, and finally as Stuxnet uh, 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 by the IT community. The malicious software temporarily halted approximately 1,000 of the 5,000 centrifuges from spinning at Natas. Um, there are significant claims that Operation Olympic Games is quite, quote, the first formal offensive act of pure cyber sabotage by the United States against another country. Um, the, and so the Stuxnet worm itself was, was uh, detected in 2000. 10, and it's the first known uh, worm to attack the supervisory control and data acquisition systems. And this, of course, has a great deal of implication for um, many of the other systems that we live with. Um, um, one of the, and this is how it works, if you want to take a look at it. I mean, it, it, it essentially gets inside and then at, at the end, it, uh, once it takes control, it sets up a, a process of false feedback to outside computers, um, uh, uh, ensuring that they won't know that what's going wrong. And the, the Isra Iranians did not understand what was going wrong. They just didn't understand. Um, uh, now, one of the things that happened, and this is why there is a great concern about cyber warfare. Cyberspace has no borders, right? Um, uh, and the key issue uh, is that there was a programming error in Stuxnet, right? And it went around the world. Uh, it started, uh, it not only hit Natez, but uh, um, it replicated on the internet uh, and uh, was subsequently exposed for public dissemination. Now, at the same time, Duku, again, it's the Hungarians, um, uh, Duku is a, uh, um, a worm discovered 
by uh, researchers at the Budapest University of Technology and Economics. Um, uh, and they analyzed what's called the malware. Um, it was designed, to, thankfully, to gather information rather than interfere with industrial operations, but it was quite effective. The following one is, wait a second, what's going on here? Oh, there we are, flame, the flame worm. Flame worm was discovered in 2012 and found to be used in, in cyber espionage in Iran and other Middle Eastern countries. Flame was 20 megabytes in total or 40 times bigger than Stuxnet. Again, people realized that this was a state on state attack. While Stuxnet was meant to destroy things, Flame's purpose was merely to spy on people. Again, it was spread using USB pin drives, and it could infect printers shared over the same network, right? Um, what's the most worrisome thing about Flame was how it got into mach machines in the first place. It went via an update to the Windows 7 operating system. A user would think she or he was simply, was simply uh, downloading a legitimate patch from Microsoft only to inst install Flame instead. Um, this was probably, uh, as some people have suggested, generated a very intense conversation between the U.S. government and Microsoft, right? Because they didn't want Microsoft's patches to be used. Um, another one is the Sony Pictures cyber attack, 2014. I, did any of you see the film The Interview, which uh, was a comedic uh, film uh, looking at... Um, the current uh, leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. Um, <laughs> it seems that um, a group called, uh, very interesting, um, it, was, it occurred in 2005, and the hacker group, which identified itself by the name Guardians of Peace, leaked a release of confidential data from the film studio Sony Pictures. The data included personal information about Sony Pictures employees and their families, emails between employees, information about executive salaries in the company, copies of the then unreleased Sony films, and other information. They demanded that Sony withdraw the film, the interview. So people rightly, I think, assumed that it was a North Korean attack. But what it did was really undermine a lot of people at Sony, right? The personal information, if you think of what personal information any of you may have left in an email or somewhere is on your computer, um, not, not great. Um, and finally, this is one of the, um, uh, the big issues, and um, I won't uh, buy this a film about it. It's so the attack on the Ukrainian power grid, and what it leads you to think about is what would happen here. What would happen here if the power grid was shut down, right? Um, there's, there's, there's some video about this, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass on it. Um, uh, the final one I want to talk about is Petya, right? Petya and uh, ultimately not Petya. Um, Petya, was, Petya was a ransomware um, uh, effort. And what... <laughs> Um, and so it tried to extract people's money. They locked their computer and tried to extract money from them and then unlock it, right? What not Petya did, which, which uh, essentially uh, advertised itself as a ransomware, was much worse. Um, uh, again, the weapons target was Ukraine, and uh, it was purely destructive. It wanted to destroy all the information, the, the, the cyber network. Uh, one of the things that happened, and again, this is the, the broader concern, is <clears throat> um, within hours of its first appearance, the worm, not Petya, raced beyond Ukraine and out to country machines, countries, countless machines around the world, from hospitals in Pennsylvania to a chocolate factory in Tasmania. Uh, it also included uh, uh, companies like Maersk, um, and other big multinational corporations. Um, if you want to look at the damage it did, right, it was supposed to be limited to Ukraine, and it went everywhere. And this is always the problem with these kinds of things. So Merck lost 807, the pharmaceutical company Merck lost 870 million, 
um, FedEx, 400 million, French construction company, a few hundred million. Um, Maersk lost uh, uh, 300,000 or so. And Maersk is the biggest shipping company in the world. It ships stock somewhere in the world every 15 minutes on average. It's, it's a big deal. So finally, what is to be done, right? Um, the UN failed completely in this regard. Um, they started a group of government ex experts uh, meeting uh, on this issue uh, from 2004 on, and the talks finally collapsed totally uh, uh, last year. Um, in the last two weeks, uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president, uh, current president of France, has issued something that uh, oh, I thought it was up there. Must, we must have lost it, but it's, it's okay, uh, Bella, it's all right. I can, I'll read some of it. It's the last slide in the group, or it should be. Um, what he did was to issue um, a call for trust and, it's the very last one, I don't know. No, nope, lost it, it's okay, not to worry. I'll just, what's that? Yeah, what is to be done is, is, the, is our question. But basically what, what, what he was trying to do, and lots of countries and institutions signed up to be part of this uh, declaration including Austria, Hungary, Ireland, about 50 countries initially signed, and guess which country didn't sign? You're right, you all know what, which one I'm talking about, that big one in, you know, to the west. Um, uh, and, and once again, you see the failure to really recognize the extensive danger that can come from, from, uh, from this, uh, these kinds of cyber attacks. So, that's it. Thanks very much. Um. <laughs>